Okay, good evening, everybody. We are glad to have you back for Sunday night worship. We're so glad to see each and every one of you. We've got a little bit of uh, some special opportunities for us tonight, and I just want to welcome each and every one of you for being a part of our service. So tonight, I'm going to recognize Brother Jody. Tonight's kind of an opportunity outreach mission awareness. Brother Jody's going to come and share our missionary of the month report, and then we'll have a song, and then... Uh, those that uh, got to go over to North Carolina and share the gospel and hurricane relief and coming in and outreach, I want them to come and share about those blessings and opportunities that God presented. So you pray for them. Bro Jody, if you'd come, sir, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Missionary of the Month, is um, the Divine Family. Uh, Brother Greg and his wife Amy are in the uh, Lake Jackson area. Uh, he's been working along the 288 corridor um, in South Texas. Um, he has uh, six children, uh, Dale, Allen, Tyler, Brooklyn, Daniel, and Levi. Um, and the church that had been planted there in 2023 um, is Coastal Way Baptist Church in Lake Jackson. Um, they can be found in uh, many different areas uh, as far as uh, contact, uh, two email addresses, both uh, Brother Greg's personal and the church's, and uh, Facebook accounts, and also uh, a good website. Uh, so I encourage you to reach out to them. Um, Brother Greg is uh, working hard in the communities. Uh, he's focusing um, most recently on hurricane barrel cleanup, and some of our guys went down to help in that area also. Uh, community car washes um, through a kickoff uh, as a public debut service that happened in July of this year. Um, he also ministers through the Pregnancy Help Center. Um, so that's an area to uh, be able to minister um, to women and men um, in times of crisis and also help them in those areas. And that's also the area where they actually meet at this time. Um, he also conducts uh, men's Bible studies on Tuesday during a parenting class. Um, He's brought his first group up from, uh, for a camp, at Texas Camp Number 4, and he's also uh, worked in past impact ministries over the past few years. So their mission is to reach Lake Jackson with the gospel and make disciples. And with that said, he asked for two specific prayer requests, uh, development of outreach efforts for the church as it continues to grow, uh, eventually, hopefully, um, finding a permanent place uh, for worship and just to reach more people for Christ, to have the opportunities through the various uh, activities that they do, and, uh, and to pray for uh, God's guidance as uh, he seeks their will. So um, please remember Brother Greg and Amy in your prayers. Uh, there's a lot of transitions in their lives right now. So be in prayer for them and um, the people of Lake Jackson and um, South Texas in general. Um, at this time, uh, Brother Penny, would you mind um, saying a prayer for this missionary? Let's uh, grab our hymns and turn to hymn 358, Because He Lives. God sent His Son, they called Him Jesus, He came to Verse 3, 
so professional look at there yeah okay I'm gonna try really really hard to keep this reasonable um, it might be a challenge for me I'm a bit passionate about this particular subject uh, so y'all bear with me I'm gonna start tonight just by saying thank you uh, thank you to my pastor uh, we love you man and uh, you have been a support to us from day one uh, I value that and I, I, I won't ever forget that. Thank you for being the person you are uh, in that sense. Um, also, very importantly, I want to say thank you to Landmark. Uh, what you did this past week was very commendable. We thank you so much uh, for your effort there and for your support. Obviously, financial support is a, a difficult challenge with what we're doing. Uh, it is a constant thing. We're constantly doing and going and trying to stay busy, and God has not slowed down the opportunities to serve. In fact, it's just more and more that takes funding. We thank you for your heart in giving that uh, for sure. But I appreciate the donation, but much more than that, I want to go a step further. We appreciate you choosing to be an advocate for the Poxhole, uh, choosing to support the cause that we believe in, which is to promote Jesus Christ and, and the way God has given us. Uh, and I think that's important to note. Uh, every one of us have a way we can serve God. And as you can see, you say, well, how do you do this cutting trees? But God has put us in way in situations where we can use what God has given us to honor him, to promote him. Uh, to show Jesus to the world around us. So we're thankful for that, and we encourage others to take on what God's given you. He's given you something specific. 
that you can do. Uh, it can be so many different things. We try to, we box that in. It's not boxed in. Just do what you can do, and you honor Jesus in that, and it, it'll work. I guarantee you he'll bless it. Um, with this said, I want to take just a few minutes. I mean, obviously our focus is going to be uh, the, the trip to North Carolina tonight, but I, I feel in my heart it's very important to create some perspective uh, about who Foxhole is, what Foxhole is uh, in that sense. And I get this question all the time. Uh, the name's a little odd, and they're like, Foxhole, I mean, wh what is this? You know, obviously, and uh, the mindset of having a group of men uh, that, you know, go back to military terms in a sense of a foxhole, you've got a brother beside you you can trust, and you're there for each other, and you're tied together, and you're supporting each other in every way. Uh, so take that and compound it and make it larger, and that's a lot of what you have. Uh, we're a group of men who, uh, man, who came together with a goal, and that goal was to become more in Christ. Pete loves to use that term. And that's exactly what it is, to become more in Christ. Uh, men who decided that uh, the status quo is no longer acceptable. I mean, like it or not, we have a status quo amongst us here. And we sit and just do what we do all too often. And we just decided in our hearts that was no longer acceptable for us as individuals. And we were wanting to go a step further with that. Um, men who made a conscious decision to seek growth. And to seek challenge, we're scared of change. We're scared of challenge in our hearts and in our, in our person often. Uh, so this is a group of men that decided we were no longer going to be afraid of the problems and the issues that were hindering us. Instead, we would confront them the way God's Word says to, and we would grow together beyond that. Uh, so the men who would do that, all with the goal of being more Christ-like. I mean, that's our ultimate goal. That needs to be every person in this room's goal. With that said, we do this as a group and support each other in that cause uh, so that we would become better husbands, better fathers, better employees, better church members, better Christians all the way around. If we can grow spiritually, if we can internally begin to process how much God's Word says, there's so much there we're just not dealing with. We're ignoring, and we're choosing to no longer ignore this, but to confront it and move forward in that challenge. This has created a camaraderie in our group that I have found nowhere else. I've worked a lot of places. I've done a lot of things. I've been in a lot of churches. I've not found a camaraderie this specific and this focused. Um, but we sought it out, okay? We, we decided to do this specifically, and... We, obviously, our camaraderie here needs to be good as a church. It needs to be better, I'm telling you, uh, in order for us to grow the way God wants us to grow. And as the foxhole, that's what we've tried to do internally, create camaraderie that we can depend on each other, we can call each other out when needed, we can move forward in that way. Uh, so that's a challenge. This, this, honestly, the camaraderie within our group is extremely important to me personally. Uh, absolutely. Very important. Uh, most of you simply see the foxhole from the sense of a service aspect. That's what you know us to be. We need a tree cut. We need this done. We need that done. That's, we understand that. And that's totally good. But my goal here tonight is for you to understand a little more than that. It's important for you to realize that we are doing the service that we do because of what the Lord is doing in our hearts individually and as a group. The service is God's growth manifested and, and an outward appearance of that. So that growth is what's causing that burden for us to do this. We don't get up every Saturday morning and go, yeah, let's, let's go cut somebody's tree or clean their yard. No, it is a burden that has come from growth within our hearts as a group. Uh, so it's really important that you understand that. Uh, we've got a motto that we like to go by as Foxhole Men. Uh, we say that we seek to be mentally, physically, and spiritually resilient. And that's, a, that's a, a, a high goal, honestly. It's a difficult goal, mentally, physically, spiritually resilient, to, in those three categories, to do our very best to succeed and to push ourselves further than we think we can go uh, in all of those areas. 
that's really hard to do alone. Maybe almost impossible to do alone, okay? But when you get in a group and you have what I am describing, it makes it possible. It makes it, your, your brother next to you is encouraging you. Your brother over here is challenging you. There is camaraderie in that that is productive for the whole. Uh, so that, that's our, our motto, if you will. Like I said, that's not an easy thing, but we, we do it together. Uh, absolutely. And as we've grown spiritually, we find ourselves more and more burdened to do more. And that's the cool thing. This thing is like taking over my life, to be honest with you. And, and, and that's an awesome thing because as he does, as it has, God has grown each one of us in specific ways. And uh, it's just like the burden gets stronger and stronger. The more work we do, and the more service we do, the more opportunities we get to speak of the Lord, watch God work in specific settings, and, and in our own hearts, uh, the more we want to do it. It has been healthy for us in every way. Um, this service aspect that you know us to be has given us an amazing platform to witness of Jesus Christ. An amazing platform. I never could have imagined that me going and cutting a tree somewhere, Caleb going and cutting a tree somewhere, and us cleaning it up when we're done could create an opportunity for someone's heart to soften in a way that they're ready to hear about Christ in a way they weren't ready for when I got there, when we got there as a group to begin with. It does something specific. Um, we have all told people about Jesus Christ in the moment, in the mall, in the gas station, at workplace, whatever. And that is something we should all continue to do. But this has created something where when we get there and we get done with the project, and, and oftentimes God brings us projects that's really hindering someone. It's, they really have a, an issue or a problem. And when we are able to go and solve that problem for them, and then sit down with them, and, and their heart is so much softer when it comes to the gospel and hearing about the Lord. And they can see it not only in our words, but they see it in our actions. Uh, so it, it has been a, a great blessing to us to be able to serve this way, to, to be able to do this thing. And God continues to bring us before very specific situations, very specific people, uh, we, we constantly find ourselves amazed at what God does in directing and moving things around. And we're like in the right moment at the right time when somebody is, is needing it the most. And that's how the Lord works. The thing is, we got to get out there. We got to get active. We got to look for that opportunity. And I know many of you are doing that. So don't catch me preaching at you. This is just a burden on my heart. I'm excited about it, though. Um, with what we've seen God do, Man, we have a, a, a new level of confidence, and, you know, obviously you can call that faith, but a new level of confidence in what we expect every time we get a project. We talk about it. We pray ahead of time. We pray before we leave that morning. We get there. We confront the people directly with the gospel. We let them know exactly why we're fixing to do this work, and sometimes we're doing significant amounts of money at work that could cost them eight to $10,000, and we can come do it for nothing. And, and if we're able to do that, it creates such a wonderful opportunity. Uh, but we have gained so much confidence in the fact that we are looking for God to do great things now. Okay, we don't just get up on Saturday morning and say, hey, let's go do this because it's a good thing to do. No, we get up because we're going to say, okay, what is God going to do today? What is he going to put in place that it, we, we, never, we have no idea but we know God called us to this particular place, this particular day for a particular reason, and he's going to work because he's in it. And he has proven that to us over and over. Uh, so our confidence in what the Lord is doing has, has grown tremendously. It's really hard to understand, as I said earlier, how going and for some reason or another, we didn't specifically pick tree work, but... It's just something I had some background in, and we just got some interest in, and before long, we're, we're pretty much tree guys. Uh, with that said, God has used that platform, as basic and simple as it may seem, to let us minister in so many places. North Carolina. I mean, we go there, 
And they did a really good job of doing a lot of hard work. There was so much damage, so much of it already cleaned up. But when they get to the difficult stuff that takes time, they skip over to move on. Well, guess what we get to do when we get there? We get to do those more. Uh, they take a little more time. It takes a little more skill set, that kind of deal. But those really work well. They're really challenging, challenging for us, but they work well in that, man, we get a, a, an opportunity to make impact. Not only does the person that we're working for specifically get impacted, the whole neighborhood typically where we're at is impacted because they understand before long, they know why we are there and what we are doing. And it is a witness beyond one household. So it is a true blessing that we get that opportunity uh, as a whole. Uh, like I said, we've found their hearts being soft. We have found it to be soul that is, is fertile to work in once we are there after we have been able to accomplish this need they have. Uh, like I said, this has created growth in our hearts. It's impacted the hearts that we serve. And I want you to know this. Every time we set out to do a project, we are specifically burdened to minister. We are specifically burdened to witness of Jesus Christ. We do not set out on these projects just to accomplish the, the specific project with the tree. That gets That's a challenge for us. Obviously, we get into doing the work. We're men. We created this to do what we do and be challenged the way uh, which creates growth in us. But every time we do this, we have gotten more and more focused. Jesus is the primary source of why we do this. Grow in our hearts and to show people how good he is, how much he loves them, how much they need him. Uh, our goal is going to always be to grow in Christ personally and to show the love of Jesus to as many people as possible. Uh, uh, one last thing before we move into the specifics of North Carolina. Uh, I've been just thinking of a verse on my heart uh, the last week or so. And uh, as I encounter people, now we encounter all different types, right? But we see a consistent, a consistent need. Uh, and the only way I can describe it, uh, I was talking in our meeting a while back, and the word's poor in spirit. We, you know, we see that in Scripture a lot. Poor in spirit in Scripture describes that person when they are at that place where they, where they are at that place where they're sensitive to their need. They know they have a need but they need to know specifically what it is, and they need to respond to the fact that Jesus is the answer to that need. We encounter people consistently in this work that we are doing that are in that state. They are poor in spirit, and they are ready. Now, it is still their choice in the moment. Even though their life's falling apart, they may not choose Jesus in that moment. But Jesus, the Lord, God is giving them that opportunity as we are able to minister to them in their time. Uh, so as I said, that's, that's been strong on my heart. Uh, and I look for a verse, and, and this speaks to me. Uh, I hope you can see what I'm saying. Psalm 113, verses 7 through 9, it says, He raises the poor out of the dust, and he lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may seat him with princes and with the princes of his people. He grants a barren woman at a home, like a joyful mother of children, praise the Lord. He pulls people out of their worst moment if they will simply choose him. And we get to the opportunity to be in that time. God has consistently put us in that place where these people need it the most and their hearts are soft for it. Pray for us that they will respond. Uh, we're going to do our part, and that's to do the work and to witness of Jesus during that time frame. Uh, so thank you for your support. Uh, I'll let the other guys come up here. Go for it. Okay, I didn't bring any notes like Kenneth did, so I don't know if that's good or bad for you, to be honest with you. Could be rough. Um, touch on a couple of things about what Kenneth said. Just real quick, uh, first and foremost is that the only thing that you have to do with the justification process is that you're a sinner. That's it. Jesus justifies. What he did on the cross justifies. But the sanctification process, you have to play a part in. It's a choice. It's something that you choose to move forward with. Now, you get 
more help than ever deserved from the Holy Spirit and the movement that happens there. But that's something that you have to make a step towards. And so I encourage you to find a group, to find people who know you. And when I say know you, I mean really know you. Uh, some of the things that we've talked about before is to be 99% known is to be unknown, especially you men out there. Um, I was the world's worst. I would uh, just assume leave and not have anybody in my business. It's a, it's a thing that we all sort of struggle with. And I'm speaking specifically to the men. I know that there's women that struggle with it too. But specifically to those men is that to find a group of guys that, I mean, that they know the deepest things. They, that they know your taxes. I mean, it's that deep, right? So the foxhole was designed originally to be that group of guys. Now, within, those guys, within that group, it, it gets to be a certain number or a certain size. It, you are going to have those three or four guys that you call, that you can call at 2 a.m., those two in the morning friends, those three in the morning friends. And we've adopted this phrase that's called corner toters. And it's in two of the synoptic gospels. If you look at Mark and you look at Luke, you'll see the story of these friends toting the corners of a mat and bringing their friend to Jesus. And when the crowd was too thick, they ripped a hole in the roof. That's what you need. That's, that is something that I really and truly encourage you to seek out. Okay, I'm going to get off on a tangent. Uh, North Carolina. It was great. This is the third time that we've done something like this. The first time was in Tyler, Texas. Uh, we had to start locally because we didn't know what we were doing. And then when we got to where we still didn't know what we were doing, we went to Houston. And whenever we were confident that we didn't know what we were doing, we went to North Carolina. So that's, that's the progression so far. And anybody in the foxhole will, will back me up on that. So let's go to the first slide real quick. And I'm going to give these guys uh, the red mic to split back and forth so if they have something they can chime in. <clears throat> okay. So... The oxymoron here is devastating beauty. That's what North Carolina looked like. I know that you went and you saw, or you watched the news, and there was a lot about Asheville specifically, right? Um, Asheville is like the, the Henderson to our Mount Enterprise or the, or the Lufkin to our Mount Enterprise. It's a bigger city. There's just more people. And so, of course, there's a lot more news coverage. Swannanoa is the smaller town. It's, it's an area with uh, probably a little bit uh, poorer popula population. It's an area that had the same exact needs. They had the same exact problems that Asheville had. It's probably about five, 10 miles to the east of Asheville, if you want to reference, there it is. Um, <clears throat> the difference is, is that the publicity that one place gets versus another, it's, it's kind of a big deal in disaster relief. Uh, whenever you talk about uh, larger agencies, things like that, uh, they, they tend to uh, give the resources probably to the higher population, which, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying it's how, it is how it is. Uh, we got a few little clips here to kind of just show you, and I'll try my best to talk through them, some of them. A uh, picture says a thousand words, a video says, I don't know, 10,000? I made that up, I don't know if that's true. Okay, next one. So this is just driving along the road on the way to our, uh, one of our projects that we have once we got there. And all throughout these mountains, it was just, it was devastating. And what's crazy is you keep looking in the background and you see this beauty. You see these, you see these nice mountains that are, I mean, perfect weather and everything else. And you see the devastation that's on the side of the road. You can go ahead and go to the next one too. So this is a two-lane road. This is what we drove on to get to one project. And you see the double, white, the double yellow line in the middle? So that whole side of the road is just washed completely out. And where that dirt is on the road is where they have had some people come back up and try to build a way to access these people. Um, there, probably a few days before we got there, some of these roads were rebuilt. So that's the other thing. Immediate response sometimes is very, very difficult just because the access is very, very, very difficult. And whenever you see, like, you can't see in that picture, which I, or in that video, which I wish we would have captured, 
But there is a drive at the top of that other mountain that is just trapped. Whoever's there is there. And, and that's the state. I just want to paint a picture of the state that these, that these individuals were living in at the time. Um, next one. So I, I tried to put together a couple of pictures, and now that we're in the project, y'all feel free to speak up. But I, I tried to put together just one or two pictures. Eric helped me out a lot. Um, of the projects that the type of projects that we go to do and when you go and you do some form of disaster relief it's it's beneficial to stay in your lane because what happens is is you will get to a place like this and everything is messed up everything is wrong it's not right it's not where it's supposed to be everything's bad and so you can try to do everything and stay in the same spot forever and touch, you know, the, the people that are in that spot. Or you can do this more specific thing and get this one project done. You've accomplished one thing and then move on to the next. So if you wonder, you know, why we don't repair roofs and everything else while we're there, while we're there this is why. So this tree, off the, the whole mountain is leveled. I mean, trees are everywhere. This one is almost completely horizontal laying on the house, which means a lot of weight. Next slide. Like the mountain behind it goes, it goes straight up. I mean, it's not level off there. So, I was, yeah. So I was, I was really questioning <laughs> how that was going to go. Well, this was something that <laughs> we really didn't know when we got into it. There was a uh, specific church member up there, and a lot of times, our in in these places when we get, we didn't know where we were going when we got up there. We didn't have a project lined up. We didn't have anything. But there are sister churches. I guess we would call them everywhere. Like. ABA churches everywhere, all across America. I know we get very tunnel visioned, but believe it or not, there's a landmark missionary Baptist church in Swannanoa, North Carolina. And so when we get there, we stop there. They allow us to stay there, which is really nice. Their whole place is filled from floor to ceiling with supplies, water, everything else, of people donating and bringing to these people. So that way that this church can give them out and also make an impact on their community for the kingdom. That's what they're trying to do. They're not just giving thirsty people regular water just so that their, you know, their thirst is quenched. They're trying to give them that living water that we read in the scriptures. So we stay there, and when we wake up the next morning, there's a guy there. He's, uh, he's a church member. He's coming to help. And Dollar, I think you talked to him, right? You want to talk about that? Mike? So him and his wife, they both uh, were meeting up there to help pass out items, you know, and, and encourage the community there. So they were, they were service-minded. Um, what they didn't have time for was going back and trying to work on their house because uh, their whole community is really devastated. Um, and they, they're, where their heart was at is, is taking care of others first. So that was a great place for us to start off uh, by helping him, right? He's focused where he needs to be. This fits our niche. We like taking you know, trees off of roofs. He's got a tree on a roof. So um, that was the first spot we went to. Uh, it was one of the most challenging ones that, that we had um, for the sake of the, the pitch on that roof. One's a metal roof, so it was really slick and it was really steep, right? So um, really challenging. Our calves were killing us by the end of the day. But the, the, what I was really happy about this one was that we were serving someone who, whose heart was there. And we, we've got two different types of people that we get to serve. Uh, people who are lost, and our focus is, you know, while we're working on that, we'll have somebody there and, and, um, and ministering to them, talking to them, building the relationships. Um, and those that are saved and are in the right place and have a church home, uh, and that we're really trying to encourage them and build them up and, and motivate them. And this was that, right? He was able to um, just have a little bit more peace of mind, knowing that his situation back at home was being taken care of. So I was really proud of that, um, and we, we came out of it safe. Uh, we, I'm sure someone's going to talk about the bear incident that was at this house. Um, so that's all really I have to say about this one. Um, yeah, so next. All right, this is probably, I don't know, is it hard to see? Probably hard to see. So there, this is from the tree that we set a block in to take it off. I was trying to take a before and after, but the other thing is devastating beauty. Once again, you see this house that's just tore up. There's a tree on it and just beautiful behind it. And every time that I would 
see something like this. And it's almost like the higher up you get in places like this, like the more beautiful it gets. So every time that I climb this tree to set a block or take a block down, I just kept thinking that God has his hand on everything, on everything. And you see this one, like from here, I'm just looking, you know, that God has the whole world in his hands. I mean, we sing it as kids, right? And I look at this one little spot of devastation. Now, keep in mind, I know there's devastation all throughout those mountains. But whenever you look over that and you see the almighty handiwork of God, you understand like, hey, this is, this is why we're here. He has a specific purpose for each of us and why we should be here. Um, next. Okay, so it's uh, one thing to work on a roof or in a tree. It's another thing to have a Black Hawk helicopter come over you whenever. Does, does the video have sound if you click the next button? Maybe one more again. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. No, oh, okay. All right. So, I, yeah, it's different working conditions. I don't know the last time that we've worked under a helicopter, but they are, they're everywhere up there because it's a disaster zone. So they're flying in, they're dropping off people. I didn't put the picture of them lowering uh, medics down to come and check. But the bridge to the top of this mountain was actually out. We drove on it anyway because we don't know any better, but it was, <laughs> but it was actually out and like separated from the road, and we'll get to that in uh, just a little bit, just so we'll hurry up. Next slide. This is Susan's friend. <laughs> uh, look, y'all. I think I lost 10 years of my life in about 30 <laughs> seconds, yeah. I was, I was very relieved. I was standing there talking to Caitlin, and she's like, uh, Miss Susan, there's a bear behind you, and I was like, okay and she says don't run and so as I <clears throat> gently pushed her out of the way and briskly and I do mean briskly walked behind uh, the car that was there I was like you know I bet she's going to eat all that dog feed they had actually put dog feed out bags of it like four or five and I thought in my mind that was for all the little poor displaced dogs and cats that didn't have anything to eat no no they feed the bears there so <laughs> But even in all their devastation, these people are, they're just, I'm so impressed with their hearts for one another because they're constantly taking care of each other. They don't take more than what they need. They're very adamant about, I need this, and you make sure that somebody else gets it that's worse off. But, and they even take care of the bears. I'm just, y'all don't hate me for this, but I think they may be tougher than us East, East Texans. They're just, they're, they're diligent. And they're so, their sense of community is just, Gosh, it, it really floored me. But they're, they, they're strong in their faith. Obviously, I don't think anybody could go through something like that without that. And, and there are others there that they don't, they don't really want to hear about it. So y'all keep praying for them and the bears. So Susan was really nice to herself in the description of what happened. She knocked Caitlin down. <laughs> don't lie. Be don't be lying in God's house. Because the old saying, like, you don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun the person next to you. Susan remembered that. So I'm just telling you, she's ruthless. I will say that my truck was locked, okay? <clears throat> Somebody locked my truck. I had nowhere to go. <laughs> go ahead and go to the next one. All right, this is the second house, and this is where we kind of wanted to get to, right? Was, so we start with a church member, and when you start in a community, everybody knows you're there. They just do. They know you're there. Well, I mean, especially in a time like this, what are they going to do? Go watch TV? I mean, there's no power. There's no nothing. They know you're there. And so every mountain also, by the way, has a matriarch. We did not know this, uh, but we found out with this particular house. Uh, at the time, uh, me, Kenneth, and Dollar were on the, the roof of this house, and all of a sudden, uh, we see this guy stroll up straight towards Susan with, y'all know me, I grew up with guns, right? Y'all know? I could not identify this Uzi-looking gun. It was, it was insane. He, so, so he walks straight up to Susan, and I'm on the roof. I look at Kenneth, and I'm like, I, I got it, So, because I was the closest. So I come over there to the side, and all this guy says is, you know, hey, Yes. <laughs> he said, two other crews have come in here and couldn't get this tree 
off of this roof. One of them had seven guys. Uh, Y'all Texas people are awesome. That awesome was my, I put that in there. That's not what he said. Uh, but he, he meant awesome. That's the synonym for, it's a synonym for what he said. Um, so he was friendly. I look back at Kenneth. I'm like, I know he don't look like it, but he's friendly. So we're good. And uh, yeah, they really appreciate it. This lady was in her 70s and uh, she just, like I said, two different uh, crews had come in there. So this whole community is now coming in and, you know, who are you guys? And they hated for anybody else to come up that mountain. This shows you the end that Kenneth was talking about earlier when you go and do something physically for someone. Um, everybody else they seem to have a problem with. We could have drove all over that mountain because they, they thought that we were doing something for this lady. That physical act was something that they really, really, really appreciated. And there's a lot of ministries out there that do that. Like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be cutting trees. This is just a physical act that puts a foot in the door. So then all these people are listening. And so the gospel is spread. One, one rock in a shoe at a time is something that we, is something that we say. So, you know, uh, Paul says that he plants Apollos waters and God gives the increase. All we're trying to do is just put a rock in a shoe. So every time they walk, every time they walk past this roof from here on out forevermore, whoever lives there will know why we took that tree off that roof. And it just gnaws and it gnaws and it gnaws and it opens that door for the next person to water and for God to give the increase. Next picture. Um, yeah, uh, next picture. That's the same house. Susan, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, this is the wife of uh, the guy that come out with his uh, gun over his shoulder. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> she she was not real sure about us being up there at first either. We kind of got the third degree at first. But once they realized that we were going to cut this, they, they were going to cut this tree off of this lady's house that they just had the utmost respect for. Um, we were kind of in. We're, we're I feel like you know we we got some connection there now, but. Um, she, they, I, get, I just, I keep going back to just how much they love their neighbors and how they're just so willing to take care of each other and do without just so their neighbors might have something. But they, golly, I, I can't even express it. it just, it's impressive. Um, <clears throat> we don't have any finished pictures of this project. We finished the project. We don't have any finished pictures of that project because we were trying to get off the side of this mountain before dark uh, for two reasons. One, because y'all saw the condition of the roads. The bridge was separated off. It, it was bad. And driving down it at dark is just as bad. Uh, for the second reason was shots were literally fired. And so we decided that uh, we should try to leave as soon as we were done. But uh, long story short, we did get it done. All those, every, we, we've made contacts with, with so many people uh, that we've actually been up there uh, and helped. Next one. Okay. Kayla, I want to say too, even, even in this situation, like several of them um, like that we helped, they all come out and they wanted to know where we're from, what we're doing there, how can they get in touch with us? Do you know, I mean, they put themselves aside and they were just, they were so thankful that they wanted to reach out later and that just gosh just their spirit is just it was impressive okay a couple of things here um one on the left the one in the red shirt uh that is ethan witt he is the aba disaster relief he's their guy they send out a uh, great guy we've worked with him a couple of trips uh one in uh of course houston that's where we met him and uh, we just kind of clicked in that sense and then we worked again with him here um as, a, as we were going up there, 14 hours, that's if you just drive. It was took us longer, obviously. Uh, Dollar has a problem with bathroom breaks, so we, we, we had to take a little longer there. Uh, with that, it, uh, it's a long way, so we could not take everything that we would normally have in that setting. So uh, I contacted Ethan and said, hey, man, are you going to be there? We need a machine. He said, I'm on my way. We'll work together. So we worked that out good. Great guy. Support them. He's doing a good work. He's a 28-year-old man that gives an amazing amount of time to this. Uh, so 
uh, that's a good thing. So we're, we're thankful for that connection. We were actually texting back and forth on this Florida thing. It went right through where he lived, uh, but they were all right on all that. Uh, I really want to focus on the, the guy in the blue shirt. Uh, this guy's name is Kyle. He is a part of the foxhole. Um, I want to describe a little bit about this situation. This is what this is the part of Foxhole that you don't see, uh, that maybe you don't understand specifically. Kyle is a guy that I work with, and I worked with him for a long time. He's a good man, uh, has a great heart, good work ethic, just a solid guy. And but he didn't know the Lord, and we had a burden for this guy. I had a burden, and Eric. Eric and I have prayed for this guy for years because Eric and I worked with him for a long time. Uh, with that said, as the foxhole began to, to do uh, tree projects, I, I got an open door. He had a couple of dead trees, and I said, hey, let us, let us come cut these trees for you, man. We'll be glad to do that. I said, this is what we do, and this is why we do it. And he's like, okay, that's fine, yeah. So one Saturday morning, we go out. We cut two dead trees down for him. We had a really good group that morning. We sat down after we got through, and we just, I mean, we did a full-blown witnessing session with him, went through the gospel and scriptures, whole nine yards. After uh, a week or two, he, he reached out to me and said, hey, y'all meet uh, on Mondays? And I said, yeah. I said, you're welcome to come. Uh, he showed up. About three weeks in, he got saved. And... I'll go a step further. As amazing as that is, this guy is one of the most committed members of our group. I will say he is extremely valuable to me and to the rest of us. Um, just to give you an example, uh, he'd be really mad at me if he was here for telling all this, but he was, uh, he was on vacation in Florida. Uh, when he, he knew, he saw the tech, we have group text, I sent out that, hey, we're thinking about going to North Carolina. Obviously, we threw it together in a hurry because we just didn't have a lot of heads up on everything. So we got it organized at the last minute. I sent out uh, like a day or two before, said, hey, we're going to try to leave on Friday. Immediately, he calls me. He's in, he was in Gulf Shores headed toward Tampa, Florida. He said, when are you going to be there? I said, well, I'm going to try to leave Friday. And uh, he said, man, that's going to be a long ways from me. That's going to be 12 hours. He's driving all the way down to Tampa. And, uh, and he's just traveling. He's got his camper with him. They're just on vacation. So last I heard from him, no big deal, but that's, that's just the way it is. So we went out, left on Friday, get there at 1245, go to bed, get up early. I get a text that Saturday morning. He says, how do I find you? And I'm like, What? I text him, and I'm like, here's the address. He said, I'll be there in 45 minutes. Dude turned around, drove all the way back, because this is that important to him. He, he, he is eat up with it, serving people, loving God, being part of the brotherhood that we have. Um, I, I want for you to see how important that is to us. The, that, I mean, God saved a man through this brotherhood, through the connection of the work and his softening and the soil was ripe, you know, we told him about Jesus and he come along and not only does he know the Lord, but he's serving God with his whole heart. And God is changing him all the time. That's a huge victory for us. We praise God for that victory every day and love the guy dearly. Okay. Uh next picture and this will be the last project so yeah the whole side of this mountain essentially fell off and ended up on top of what we could see Ethan and I drove around that morning actually uh, we split up I think Kenneth and Dollar went one way me and Ethan went another we met back at the church because there's no cell service so met back at the church to say where are we going well we saw this on the side of a mountain there and we had when we saw it, we took pictures of it, just thinking, all right, there's trees on this, on this mobile home, right? But you see the camper on the, on the right of that mobile home? That is what the, the people who were living there were actually living in. We didn't even see the camper. 
camper was completely covered up. The only reason that that camper is still around is because that old mobile home was still there. So when the trees fell, that's what stopped the trees from crushing this mobile home. And uh, Dollar or Kenneth, is one Destiny? This is the one that uh, probably had the most effect on me. Uh, I go up to the house, I'm the first one at the door. We're just checking to see if there's anybody even there. Uh, we, we can't see the camper at all. It's a cave. All the trees that you can see on the picture on the left uh, are completely covering the whole right side of, if you're looking on the right picture, th that whole right side of the, uh, the, the single wide is covered up. Can't see a thing. So I go around to the left. The door is broken. Um, you can tell the roof's broken. I can kind of see in. It doesn't look like it's anybody's living in there. It looks abandoned. I'm coming back around, and I kind of catch a glimpse of that camper. And I'm thinking, you know, Maybe I'll just go back there and just see. Um, but everybody, you know, you want to be careful with this because everybody's got guns there and they're very territorial, right? And so, um, so I go and I'm like, hey, is anybody there, you know? And I hear this faint voice. Um, sounds like someone's just barely alive and you were dead asleep. And this lady, I finally make contact. I'm talking to this, uh, this man through the door and a lady. And I said, hey, you know, we drove all the way from Texas to, you know, cut these trees off your, your camper. Do you mind if we do, do a little work? And I'll tell you, she, people are so broken there. After everything that they've gone through, uh, she was very indifferent. It was just kind of, I guess, okay. You know, it didn't, it was like, you know, what can you do to make this any better for me? There's nothing else we can do. Go ahead and do what you'd like. Uh, so we went ahead and started doing it, and we're working, and as you can see, we did a lot of work, and it, that was really hard. Everything was precarious because we're on the side of a hill, and you, that doesn't do it justice. Uh, and we're on campers, and the roof is, you know, a couple millimeters thin. Everything was dangerous. Um, but she eventually came out, and as I'm talking to her, getting to know her while the guys are doing the work, um, her story, she originally was from Seattle. She moves to Michigan. She moves from Michigan to there. So she's only been there for a couple of years. She's a single mom with three kids and now a fourth because um, one of her kids' friends can't find her parents um, after the storm. And that's been, you know, a week at least. So um, most likely she's, she's not alive anymore. Um, and so she's taking up, taking care of for that one. But all the kids are away staying at somebody else's house in another town because of the power situation. Um, as she's telling me about this, I'm wondering why no one else in the, in the neighborhood has helped her out so far. Um, you know, there's a, there's a Missionary Baptist Church a mile away from there. Uh, no one uh, came to her need at all, and it broke my heart. Now, there's definitely some great people on that hill and up and down those roads, but for her specifically, whatever her situation was, she had no relationships or ties to that community. Um, and in her time of need, there was no one there for her. And that, I mean, that was why God sent us there. And, my, and to me, like, this was the most important thing. The, the situation she did at that point was to be able to get her camper out of there. There was nothing left for her there on that hill. She needed to be able to pull her camper out, and she had no way. I mean, it took us all, literally all day long to get it clear where that could happen. Um, and, and that, they, yeah, they're not planning on restoring the power in that area. They were, they were just like, she has to. She was pretty much sitting there waiting to die, for all we know, because there was no future forward and no one was coming to help. We got that off there for her. So now she's able to take that. Eventually, they're going to set up camps or something where people with campers can go and park, where they'll have power and water and everything. Um, the sewage is having to go straight out of the camper, just right onto the ground. So there was a horrible situation. Um, so we were able to provide that to her. Um, and along with, you know, a lot of good talk with her and really encouraging her and, and witnessing to her. And what broke my heart and really what I took from this was, you know, we're doing this in North Carolina. And, you know, going to disaster things is, is really important to us. But a lot of what we do is here at home in Mount Enterprise within 20 miles of here. And that right there hit home to me. If we, God forbid, have a disaster in Mount Enterprise, and people from out of state come to us and they're able to find people like that in our community, then we have done something wrong. We've completely dropped the ball. And that's really my mission. That's why I'm part of the foxhole because 
because every week we're, lo we're looking, our ears are open, our eyes are open, our hearts are waiting for, that for the Holy Spirit's Spirit to say, go talk to this person, knock on that door. And my goal is that we're able to contact everybody out here. That way they're not sitting here left alone. They need to have somebody to go to. Go to. And I do, I pray she's, she makes it through it and everything gets better for her. Um, but more than anything, and I hope it's not selfish of me to just think about us when I see her, but that opened my eyes to that. I don't want Destiny's situation in Mount Enterprise. When somebody like Destiny comes to this community, they need to find us or we need to find them. And they need to know who to call when they're in that situation. Destiny said, uh, just please don't, don't crush my camper because all the trees are on top because it's all that I've got left. That was it. That's all she's got. Um, so happy to help. As a matter of fact, that is Destiny's primary reason, but I want to show you this, the secondary thing that happens. Next slide. So this is while we're working on this house. So you go there and you, focus, you have one focus, and that focus is to spread the gospel. And then it gets, you know, sort of narrowed down, and you're on this one person. And, and then the next thing you know, Kenneth is standing on the roof, and he looks out, and that's the side of the road that's just sloughed off. And he sees all these people standing there just watching us. So these are now all other witnessing opportunities to share the gospel with everybody who's on that hill, all because of a service mindset, a servant mindset. Uh, Jesus took on a servant mindset. We should take on a servant mindset. The impact is more than we will ever, ever, ever know when you help one person with the intention of spreading the gospel, sharing Jesus with that person. Look, I mean, this is a small microcosm of what happened on that entire hill. Um, next, I think that's okay. This is the, the final picture. Uh, this is Miss Letha. I told Letha, and uh, she, not Lisa, Letha. As a matter of fact, the way she told us her name was, it's Letha. My friends call me Lethal Weapon. Uh, and she ain't lying. <laughs> she, uh, she is the matriarch of this mountain, and, and, everybody knows it and she owns all of that like right up there where they were working yeah Every, everybody knows it everybody um uh, they respect miss letha because she runs that she runs that side of the mountain but um long story short uh, she was i mean i was a little bit scared of her when she first drove yeah. up there because i thought she was gonna make us leave she's like what are y'all doing i'm like well, ma'am. <laughs> anyway, she, they were just they were just very leery of strangers coming in and, and taking advantage of them. And, and not, we can all understand that, I'm sure. But um, once she figured out, and she stayed there pretty much all day and watched, uh, watched them work. And, um, yeah, drove up and down her mountain there, makes, making sure that cars weren't going too fast. And, um, yes, making some threats. She, she wasn't playing, y'all. She was not playing. Yeah, but anyway, the, the longer I stood there and talked to her, the more she let her guard down. And there's, there's just so much brokenness there just within her. But despite all of her, her brokenness that she has, she had been sharing with me. She goes, I've been going to all of these donation areas. Um, she goes, and I've been picking stuff because a lot of the people there, that, that was called the, that was the Long Branch community, right? The other one was the bee tree. So this was called the Long Branch Community. And what she had been doing, though, been, because she still had her car, um, a lot, some of them didn't have vehicles or they couldn't get out, but she had been going to all of these donation areas, collecting the things that they need for their babies or whatever it is that they needed. And she had been dropping this off. And I, I have to tell you, when I first met her, I was like, gosh, she's very grumpy and I, yeah. She was able to run us off this mountain, but her heart really softened towards us. And um, by the end of the day, um, we were her people. Um, and the guy, I, I think they were in that other picture. When we're the one that Ken took. There's some people across the road, and um, they had um, they had 
or home up to us and told us, you know, we could come in and use the restroom or whatever we might need while we're there. There's food there if we needed that. And just for them to be in that situation that they're in, but they would open their home up to us and offer to us anything that they might have was just, it's very humbling. Um, we were even promised a free bear hunt, but I told them they could keep that. I, I did not need no bear hunt. Caleb might want it, but, um, but yeah, Miss Letha, she, she was a hoot, but I've, I've been texting with Miss Letha and, um, they are, you know, they're making the best of it. And like I said, I just, I just so admire their sense of community and just their love for one another and, and love for Christ. And, and you can see it there. I think we've probably ran over our time, Brother Pete. Apologies, but you put like me and Kenneth loud mouths up here together. So that's more on you at this point. <laughs> um, thank you uh, from all of us. I, I can't even begin to say what it means that you guys were willing to Help us out with the expenses to get there. The, I mean, I grew up here, so thank you for my entire life of ministering to me, everything else. Um, Dollar, you want to close us out in prayer? I mean, we have business meeting, but close this session well, out. Pete, Pete's going to pray. Gonna... Oh, you're good? Along with everything else that we've already talked about and, and, and said that we saw on the ground, one thing that really stood out to me was the response. It wasn't the federal government. It wasn't, you know, FEMA, all those things that, um, you know, we come to expect to be what takes care of things like this. It was churches all over the United States that responded and people like y'all who sent their love and prayers and, and money to support them. That is what is holding them up. That's what's got them through every single day up to this point. And I just thank you all for participating and doing that and loving on them. So I just want to say and thank you for your willingness to serve. What they freely did and not every one of us could do, we still have opportunity to do. And what I mean by that is what the gospel says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. And you don't have to pack up a truck and go to North Carolina to understand there is necessity all around us. And I appreciate what Garrison said, because that is real. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. That needs to be every one of our hearts. And because of that heart, it opens the door for us to see individuals purpose in their heart, not because a pastor drives the ship, but because we are burdened for people here that we realize there are needs there. And we do the uttermost part of the earth and whatever that looks like. And that may be a trip to North Carolina or Tim and Cindy, that's going to mean a trip to Florida um, or whatever opportunities that God puts in front of us this week. And that's what I want to pray about. There are people with real need in North Carolina still. And it's easy because of the next week and the next news story that we forget about what happened before. And yes, Florida has happened since. And I know a lot more people in Florida than I do in North Carolina. But God knows every one of these people and every one of these people matter. So it doesn't matter about any of our biases or individual preferences, people matter to the Lord. And you and I get to do this together in Christ, and it's such a wonderful thing. But that starts and continues through the power of prayer. So tonight, instead of the traditional ending of a service like this, I want us to collectively gather and circle up in prayer tonight, if you would. I know that's always a navigational challenge, but nonetheless, I'd just like for us to circle around starting up here and work our way around.